Hi, this is Reagan Wielden. I'm here today to talk to you about special education law. The history of special education law began with Brown versus the Board of Education in 1954. In this case, the Supreme Court applied the 14th Amendment, concluding education must be made available to all on equal terms in regards to race, specifically for this case. However, it also determined that every individual deserves access to an equal education. The 14th Amendment specifically states that no state excuse me, shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor to deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. Essex states that students are entitled to due process of law when a property is involved because students have a property interest in attending public schools. Therefore, Brown versus the Board of Education applies to special education law because students with disabilities also have a property interest in attending school. This was the beginning of the change in legislation to protect vulnerable, excuse me, vulnerable groups of individuals such as students with disabilities. Following Brown versus the Board of Education, the first legislation specifically aimed at providing protections for those in need of special education was called the Rehabilitation Act. It was enacted in 1973. The Rehabilitation Act, Section 504, specifically applies to individuals with disabilities. To qualify, the disabilities must affect the individual's ability to access an educational environment in the same way as those without disabilities. As explained in the textbook, an individual with a disability is one who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. These limitations require reasonable accommodations and modifications to the individual so that the individual, excuse me, can participate in the same environment or program as those without disabilities, the same as their peers. Section 504 states individuals with disabilities must not be excluded because of their disability. However, they must be in current need of assistance. That means the disability can't have resolved or been only a past need. They need to, they have the need now. The individual must also not be otherwise qualified or have a disability that also impacts their learning. In this case, the student would be referred to special education for a possible individualized education plan. Before we get to that, I do want to talk about the Americans with Disabilities Act. Further, it is a further step in special education law, which began in 1990, with the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is also called the ADA. Title II of ADA applies to public schools. Title III applies to private schools. ADA prohibits discriminations, discrimination, excuse me, against birth, excuse me, against persons who are disabled from their birth to their death. ADA demands schools who are not federally funded still comply with accessibility regulations. Thus, regardless of federal funding, ADA allows and protects individuals to still be able to access those environments. Should a potential violation occur, complaints must be filed within 100 day and 80 days of the potential violation. Confirmed violations will require corrective actions and assurance that discrimination will not recur. Private schools, however, may not be required to fully comply with corrective actions if these actions would result in undue burden or be cost and facility prohibited. Instead, the private schools may be asked to comply with those corrective actions that are reasonable for them and achievable based upon their resources. The Individuals with Disabilities Act was actually put in place prior to the ADA um, legislation, and this was in 1975. It was originally called Part B of the Education of the Handicapped Act. It was amended and became known as the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA, 
In 1997, it was further amended in 2004 and 2011, and now includes Part B that applies to the individuals with disabilities who are ages 3 through 21. Part C applies to individuals with disabilities birth to age 2. IDEA is directed and enforced by the Office of Special Education Programs and Rehabilitative Services, or OSERS. To qualify, a student must have a disability that impacts their ability to learn at the same rate as their same age peers. Student may, students may qualify under eligibility such as an intellectual disability, a vision impairment, autism, an emotional disorder, a specified learning disability, a hearing impairment, or other health impairment, which could include disorders such as cerebral palsy, ADHD, a traumatic brain injury, and then there is also a speech language impairment. The primary importance of the identification and eligibility classification of students with disabilities is to ensure the student is correctly identified and that those needs are properly addressed. To further explain IDEA, once the student with the disability is identified, evaluated, and the correct eligibility is determined, that individual be, will be placed on an individualized, ex, excuse me, education plan or IEP. It begins with the evaluation, which is done by a school psychologist or educational diagnostician. These results will determine the eligibility the student qualifies under if any, at that point, an, an, an IEP is created by the IEP team. The IEP team consists of the classroom teacher, the special education teacher, the administrator, service providers such as speech, speech therapists or school social workers, parents, and the student. In the case of the evaluation and eligibility determination, the evaluator is also included. In both cases, however, parental consent is required to implement any plan or to agree with any proposed eligibility. Both must be team decisions with the parent being the deciding factor. Should the parent disagree or refuse any or all of the proposed actions, they have the right and the district is no longer held liable for providing services or accommodations for the child in the realm of special education. However, should the parent change their mind, the district then will need to make those adjustments and make sure that child's accommodations and services are put in place. Further, the IEP is considered a legal document that outlines services, goals, and accommodations designed to best help the student receive a free and appropriate public education, or FAPE, which they are entitled to under the IDEA Act. FAPE must be made available in the least restrictive environment or LRE. The LRE is always a student's access to as many hours as possible during the school week alongside their same age peers participating in similar or the same activities with needed accommodations and supports. This is incredibly important and a large part of the IEP. In conclusion, I just want to briefly run through the special education law that we have discussed, which began in 1954 with Brown versus the Board of Education. We know that that original suit was based on racial discrimination occurring in public schools and segregation. However, the Supreme Court determined that all students have the right to an equal education. Thus, it was the beginning of the change in legis legislation to protect vulnerable groups of individuals like those children with disabilities. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act was enacted in 1973. This applies to individuals with disabilities in which the disability affects their ability, their ability to access an educational environment in the same way as their same age peers. Americans with the Disabilities Act, ADA, was passed by Congress in 1990 which prohibits discrimination against persons from their birth to their death who are disabled. And that is, again, getting them access to those environments. IDEA, which actually be began before ADA in 1975 and was called Part B of the Education of the Handicapped Act, 
and was amended in 1997 when it, when it became IDEA, and then again in 2004 and 2011. To qualify, a student must have a disability that impacts their ability to learn at the same rate as their same age peers. Once identified, evaluated, and the correct eligibility is determined, an individual education plan is recreated by the IEP team. The IEP is a legal document that outlines the services, goals, and accommodation, accommodations designed to best help the student receive a free and appropriate public education. And lastly, in our conclusion, I, I just wanted to touch on what IDEA specifically requires. It is our current legislations that pretty much dictates what we need to do and not do in the realm of special education. School districts must follow guidelines in placement of students with disabilities, whether that means a 504 or an IEP, and it is determined by the student's needs. The Supreme Court has asked lower courts not to define an appropriate education, rather their review is limited to two questions when a case is brought before them, and those questions are, has the state complied with the procedures identified in the Act? And is the IEP developed through these procedures reasonably calculated to enable the child to receive an educational benefit? State and local educators and administrative review officials are typically those charged with monitoring and ensuring compliance with the nature of IEPs and the matters of pedagogy. Failure to comply with Section 504 and IDEA can result in mandated corrective action from various parties such as the State Department of Education or court systems, the loss of federal funding and or litigation. Keeping all of this in mind, we understand now that how imperative it is that students with disabilities are protected and that they have the same rights and access to education as those without disabilities. It is our job as educators to ensure that they do. Scripture tells us individuals with disabilities were created for God's glory and as the example for his love and grace, just as we all were. In John, it is written, his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he has been born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Further, he tells us, that we were all created in his image, no one person less than the other. In Psalms, for you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. He knew our purpose. He knew when he formed us that we had a special place on this earth, regardless of what disability we may or may not have. And lastly, God has charged us with looking out for one another, ensuring equal access to the benefits of our world, such as education, especially those with individuals with disabilities. He says, therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. Therefore, we need to make sure that we are putting in together accommodations and services that won't be stumbling blocks, but instead be stepping stones to the best quality of life and fulfilling the purpose God has for each one of our students. Thank you for bearing with me today, and I hope that you were able to gather something from this presentation. Thank you so much.